Uh, and that's the start of our English portion of the talk track for today. Uh, Neil is working on Sequoia PGP, which you're going to present to us today. He has in the past also worked on GNU PG with uh, its founder, who I recently uh, misnamed as Roland Koch. It's obviously Werner Koch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's also worked on the herd. So those are some thick boards to uh, drill through. And let's hear about this particular very thick board. Welcome, Neil. Thank you for that introduction. So I'd like to start, as many great stories start, with Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, there was a program called PGP. And Phil Zimmerman made the first release in 1991. During the first Datensprung, which was 20 years ago, that means that PGP was already a teenager, so it's quite old. And over the past 33 years, PGP and its successors have helped a lot of people. And I just want to give a couple of examples. This is a message that Phil received in 1996. It's from somebody in Romania. And part of it says, any document was liable to be confiscated, and every Romanian in the book will be visited by the security police. But since PGP, we have been able to sleep better at nights. In 1999, he received another letter from people involved in activism in Guatemala. He said that they use PGP to encrypt their databases every night so that if a death squad attacked the office, the data would not be accessible. Those are stories from the 90s, when it was okay for software to be hard to use, they had real reasons to use it correctly. And we've heard lots of stories about how PGP is so hard to use. And yet we have here a paper from 2017 looking at the OPSEC of the journalists involved in the Panama Papers. And one of the striking decisions the researchers wrote was making PGP encrypted email the default communication method. And not only did they use it with the system, they used it among themselves willingly. And they were successful, they conclude. But that's not the only paper. We have another paper here from 2021, just a few years ago. The researchers surveyed some activists in the US who were being monitored, so there were active attacks on them. And they found that the long-term use of PGP by, their, by the people that they talked to was over 50%. They were surprised at the, the willingness of these people to engage with the software even though it was hard to use, and successfully. In the introduction, we heard that I used to work on GNU PG. I did a series of 25 interviews with people who, who rely on GNU PG for their work. And here are our picture, pictures from nine of them. And one of the quotes from Alex Abdo, who works for the ACLU, he wrote, or he said, we use a lot of different encryption technologies, but probably none more important than GNU PG. I think PGP has saved lives. It has helped journalists, and it has protected vulnerable people. And I think that's a great story. But is it a story of the past, or does PGP have a future? And there's not just PGP, of course. Now there's a standard called OpenPGP, which was actually written in 1996. And there are many different implementations. And I would say that OpenPGP is still pretty good. It's a decentralized solution. It works offline. It has a really good public key infrastructure. And it's an IETF standard. And that's why we decided that we wanted to continue working on OpenPGP, although we were unhappy with some of the things that GNU PG had decided, in particular regarding its usability. So there were three of us working on GNU PG with Vanar. And there were some disagreements. We worked on the code base. We talked to application developers who were integrating GNU PG into their code. We listened to users. And people were really happy 
about GNU PG and what it offered them, but at the same time, they were frustrated. And we got ideas about how to improve it. And we had many discussions with Werner, and we didn't agree on a way for forward. And that's fine. We didn't want to force Werner to change his, his baby that he had been working on for 20 years at that point. And so we did the, I think, a reasonable thing. We left G10 code, and we decided to found Sequoia. And we were able to do that with the financial support of the PEP Foundation, and we had a, an incredible mandate, which wasn't to build a product, but to just improve the open PGP ecosystem. And we have some technical goals, which I think are really important, and they have informed the development that we've done over the past seven years. The first one is that Sequoia takes a library-first approach. We worked on a low-level library, and it's a library. It's not a, a program that you have to call from your application. It's a library that you link to. It provides unopinionated, low-level interfaces. We don't try to tell you how to use OpenPGP, but the interfaces are designed to be safe by default, and this is essential. That means that if you want to do something unusual, and sometimes it's justified, you can still do that. But the API guides you to do the safe thing. And on top of that, we have higher level interfaces. These are easier to use, but they're opinionated. And then we have optional services. So for instance, a certificate store, a key store. These are essential for many applications, but not for all applications. So for instance, if you have a, a server program, it's running on your server, you don't need a certificate store because you probably already have a database. You want to use your database. And so these services that we provide and that many applications appreciate, they're optional. You can use the lower level libraries, without a problem. And the other, perhaps most important thing, was that we really wanted to critically look at the existing paradigms about the workflows that are suggested by the tools. But before we get to that, I want to just show you a little bit how Sequoia is built. So at the, at the bottom, we have our OpenPGP library called OpenPGP. And then there are a bunch of components. We have the, the key store, a certificate, certificate store, the web of trust library, a network library, a library for autocrypt, a library for the configuration of the crypto policy. And all of these things are built on top of OpenPGP. And then we also have a uh, OpenPGP implementation independent uh, certificate store library called PGP certi. And this allows different implementations to share state. And then built on top of those things, we have, for instance, SQ, which is our primary command line tool, and it uses all of the high-level libraries and services that, that we've built so far. But as I said, not everything requires all of those libraries. So for instance, RPM uses Sequoia since about three years or so. And it doesn't deal with secret key material, so it doesn't need the key store. It has its own certificate store. It has its own trust model, so it doesn't use the web of trust library. But it does use our configuration policy, so you can pick and choose. Now I mentioned SQ, which is our command line library. And that's the thing that we've been spending the most time on over the past year and a half. And we're about to do a 1.0 release. It's not the only command line interface tool that we have. We also have SQV, which is a, a small verification tool. We have SQOP, which is an implementation of the stateless OpenPGP interface. And we have GPGSQ, which is a re-implementation of the GPG command line using all of the Sequoia services. So it's just a, a drop-in replacement. Now the target audience for SQ is advanced users. It's developers, and it's people who are working on distributions like Debian or Arch. Now, 
I told you that we have a library first approach, and so one of our primary non-goals for SQ is to be everything to everyone. Now, of course, there are people who have legitimate uses of esoteric features, and that's fine. We want to support them. And that's why we have a library, and so we encourage them to use this lower-level interface. We want SQ to be clean and easy to be understand. So SQ is opinionated. We don't support everything from SQ. We spend a lot of time, we're doing a user study, we're talking to UX experts, they're evaluating our API in order to make sure that when we release 1.0, we have a coherent and usable CLI. That all of the commands function in similar ways, that patterns reappear across all of the, the different subcommands. And again, we have this idea of being safe by default. We've designed the commands to be safe. You can opt out of safety if you want to do something different or if you have to do something different, but the default is safe. And the different commands we have, they, they all have hints. So when you generate a new key, SQ helpfully says you've generated a new key. If you're happy with it, then you can consider uploading it to a, a key server. And then it even tells you what command you can use. So we guide the users. And then I would say the most interesting things that we try to do with SQ are serve a range of different threat models. And the work workflows that we're working on, we spent a lot of time thinking about, and we've tried to make them UI independent. So an interesting, well, what does that mean, UI independent? Well, I said before that SQ's intended audience is advanced users. But end users, in the end, they have the same needs. They, they want to authenticate a certificate. I want to encrypt a, a message to Alice. Is this her certificate? They want to verify a signature. They downloaded Fedora from the Fedora website. How do they check that the, the signature is correct? They received a, a message that's encrypted. They want to decrypt it. How do they do it? The workflows are fundamentally the same. It's just the UX that's a little bit different. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how should users engage with the tool? What are the, the workflows that are appropriate? And we came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter whether you're a beginner, medium, or advanced user. The workflows are fundamentally the same. It's mostly different UX in the way that you're guided. And what does it mean to serve a range of different threat models? So the, the threat model that most of us probably have is that we live in, in Germany or in Europe. We're worried about mass surveillance. Maybe we're worried about phishing. We're individuals. There's nobody that's actively attacking us. Of course, some people maybe here in particular. Maybe there are some targeted attacks on you. There are vulnerable populations, in particular activists. And companies also are worried about their security. The next step up, and I actually don't like to think about it as being sort of a layered thing because there are sometimes orthogonal attacks that are relevant to one group but not to another. But we have nation states, so for instance, the type of people that Snowden and WikiLeaks are worried about. And then at the you're about to die spot is Mossad, the Israeli secret service. And so at the one end, we can think about maximally automating things, making it as easy to use as possible, not asking any questions. And once we get to nation states, then we really want strong authentication. Things have to work. We can't make mistakes. If the program is not 100% certain that things are correct, we need to ask the user. And if your threat model includes Mossad, you know, sorry, good luck with that. So what do we do? How can we support different threat models? Because they have fundamentally conflicting goals. As I said, on the one hand, we have individuals worried about privacy. They don't want to be worried or bothered 
with security concerns and security questions. Any type of input is annoying, preventing them from getting work done, the work that they really want to do. They don't want to answer security questions. And on the other end, we have people who are really worried about dying, going to prison, and being tortured. They're willing to answer these questions. They want to answer these questions. They want to feel that the tool is doing, is working for them. And so we can have fewer automated decisions. Now you could say, ah, okay, this is all very, very complicated. There's no way that you can serve all of these different groups. We should have specialized tools. And I would say to that, yeah, that's nice, and maybe the specialized tools are perfect, but they require a lot of training. Imagine that you're a normal individual, as most of us are, more or less, and something happens. Then all of a sudden, we're triggered. We become activists, and we become a little bit worried. Maybe the people that we're interacting with tell us, you know, you have to be more careful now. There are people who are trying to attack us, who are trying to stop our activism. Now the person is worried about some concern, maybe a societal concern. They want to fix this problem. They don't want to learn new tools. So we need to pick people up where they are. We need to introduce it, these solutions into the existing tools so they can focus on their activism. And the way that I like to imagine this is that we have a dial. We have gentle, slow on one side, normal, fast on the other. Choose your own adventure. You become an activist, you dial it up. You go out of the group, you turn it back down. And so we're able to control the trade-off between security and automation. And the big advantage is that these people, then they're able to work with the same tools. They're already familiar with 95% of the functionality. They have less to learn. And this is essential to feeling confident that you're doing the right thing. And so how does that fit into SQ? Well, I want to do a small case study. There are many ways that it does, but in particular, I think authentication is very important. What is authentication? In the context of encryption, authentication means I want to send a message to Alice. In order to encrypt to her, I need a certificate. I get a certificate from someone, from some place, and I think that it belongs to Alice. Okay, I think. So what does I think mean? Does it mean that I'm 10% confident? Does it mean that I'm 100% confident? That's the authentication part. Am I confident? How confident am I that Alice controls this certificate and only Alice controls this certificate? On the other side, I receive a message from Bob. And it has a digital signature. I can see that the digital signature is mathematically correct. My program said, yes, this signature checks out. We did the math for you. Those big numbers, they work. There's a certificate. Bob's name is on it. But is it, is it really Bob's? Couldn't Mallory have created that certificate? Of course Mallory could have created that certificate. I need to somehow check that this is a certificate that Bob really uses. And that's authentication. And it's a fundamental. It is a, a fundamental security property of any system where we're worried about confidentiality and integrity. Is the encrypted message really encrypted if it is encrypted to the wrong recipient? I would say no. Does the signed message mean anything if we don't know who controls the certificate? Again, I would say no. Without authentication, there is no encryption. There are no signatures. So what do we do in SQ? When you want to encrypt a message to somebody, and in this case I'm using Eustace's certificate, 
which we can identify via this long fingerprint, C, B, C, D, et cetera. And the certificate also has a self-signed user ID, which includes the email address justus at sequoia-pgp.org. So I could use either one of those. Of course, using the fingerprint is very complicated. It's implicitly authenticated. I probably wrote it down and then I typed it in. It took me all of five minutes. I had to correct it four times, but it worked. So we know that that's authenticated. You're using this unique name that nobody can forge. But it's so inconvenient. We want to use human-readable identifiers. In particular, we want human-readable identifiers that are meaningful to me. Or at least that's I, what I want. You want human-readable identifiers that are unique to you. Or meaningful to you, sorry. So we have a certificate. It has a self-signed user ID. So we, we think that there's some association, but anybody could have created a certificate with that user ID on it. So should the name really be associated with the certificate? In SQ, authentication is mandatory. There is no concept of a curated ring, key ring. When I attempt to encrypt to the certificate that has the name justus at sequoia-pgp.org, SQ refuses. It says none of the certificates with the email address can be authenticated using the configured trust model. It refuses to encrypt. We have to do something. There's no, do you want to do it this one time? No, you have to do something. That sounds horrible, right? Nobody's going to use this tool. If we want to use it in a decentralized fashion, it seems like, oh, we have to go to a key signing party. We have to exchange business cards, and we have to type all of these fingerprints. This is high overhead. This is a good way to make sure that most people are not going to use the tool, and those who do use it, use it incorrectly. It's just too nerdy. And even for the nerds, it's not always feasible. So yeah, it provides the strongest guarantees, but it's usually impractical. We can look for inspiration on the web because the web is authenticated, right? If you go on the web, you visit a website and it's protected with HTTPS, you have this nice little uh, star or whatever telling you that it's, it's looking good. It's encrypted, you're really talking to who you think you're talking to. How does that work under the hood? There are hundreds of global CAs, certification authorities. These are governments, these are companies, there are even a few nonprofits that go ahead and, and they check on your behalf that this certificate really belongs to Alice. That's nice of them. Are they aligned with your interests? I would say no, they're weakly aligned at best. Of course, they're trying to provide a service and they want to provide a service to 99% of the people 99% of the time. The rest of the time they want to spy. They want to maximize the returns. This means that they're going to be careless and they don't really care about your privacy. And the, the sad thing is, is that any one of them can compromise your security. And a lot of them are willing to do that even though there are many out there that are good. And you as a user, you don't have a choice. The trusted CAs, your trust routes, they are determined by your OS or your browser. They're built in. And if you don't have them, you basically can't go on the web. It's a systemic problem and it's hard to change. Nevertheless, these global CAs, they're, they're kind of a reasonable starting point. If we had a different system, where you could opt into using them, then, then maybe, maybe it would be a good start. And yeah, I admit, they're often good enough for privacy. We can partially rely on them. So can we do global CAs in OpenPGP? Well, there are no commercial CAs for OpenPGP these days. Uh, there, was, there was one years ago, but that has since closed. But there is... A key server out there, it's a new key server, keys.openpgp.org, and it's a verifying key server. Well, what does that mean, verifying? What are they verifying? Do they come to your house, they check your ID? No. You upload a certificate to keys.openpgp.org, you get an email, and it says, is this really your certificate? If so, click here. 
You click on the link, it's a capability, it brings you to their keys.openpgp.org website. And now the keys.openpgp.org website has strong confidence that you actually control this email address and you just confirm that this is your certificate. And so keys.openpgp.org only publishes certificates with the email addresses or the user IDs that the user has actually verified. And so this is a de facto CA, right? They're doing a verification step here. So can we leverage this? Because keys.openpgp.org is only a de facto CA. They don't actually run a certificate authority. And so our observation was that, well, it's acting like a CA. What should we do? We could do an ad hoc solution where we say, okay, somehow keys.openpgp.org is special and we have another database. But we wanted to do better than that. We wanted to use the, the web of trust, which provides a, a, a really beautiful calculus to determine these things and to combine evidence. We wanted to use that. So we came up with the idea of having a shadow CA. So when I go to keys.openpgp.org and I ask for the certificate for Eustis and I download it, well, that connection was protected by HTTPS, so I know that I was talking to keys.openpgp.org, and I also know that keys.openpgp.org, at least they say, they verify the, the user IDs. Ah, I can locally make a certificate that's just for keys.openpgp.org. And then I use that certificate locally to sign the certificate and Eustace's user ID. So locally, I remember, in the web of trust, there's a keys.openpgp.org CA, a shadow CA, that's standing in for keys.openpgp.org. And it said that Eustace's certificate is this one. Huh, that's good to know. And this stand-in certificate for keys.openpgp.org, it's not fully trusted, right? It's still a global CA. They could be compromised. Their interests are sort of aligned mostly socially and not technically, right? I trust keys.openpgp.org because it's run by people in the community. It's not run by some government that's a little bit shady or a corporation that's primarily interested in profit. So I have some social trust. But I still don't want to trust it fully by default. So what does that look like? I download Eustace's certificate from keys.openpgp.org and then I can use this interesting command here SQPKI list, and I provide Eustace's email address, and then this option show paths. And it shows me that starting at a local trust route, all users have a, a local trust route, that if we take a couple of steps, we get to download it from keys.openpgp.org, and keys.openpgp.org said that CBCD, that certificate, should be associated with this user ID. Well, that's pretty good. And we see also, it says path one of four trust amount one. So it's not completely trusted. In OpenPGP, you have to have a trust amount of 120 in order to consider something to be completely authenticated. Another interesting thing is that it says path one of four. Why are there four paths? Well, the web of trust is able to combine partial evidence Maybe I'm not completely willing to rely on keys at openpgp.org, but there's some other people who also said that, and so, well, it seems for me, personally, it's enough evidence. So some other shadow CAs that we maintain are one for keys.mailvelope.com. Proton also verifies all of the certificates are correctly associated with email addresses. It's not a, a global CA in that sense. It's only for their customers. And then it's also possible to get Certificates via WKD, that's the web key directory. That is a basically a directory that's on a web server and you're able to insert OpenPGP certificates into that directory and the key is the email address, but only for that local domain. And so because not anybody is able to modify the WKD, just the the system administrator or the, the website administrator. We have some confidence, we have some evidence that that is correct. 
And Dane is basically the same thing as WKD, but it's for DNS. And all right, that's a tiny bit complicated, but maybe at the command line interface level, that's something that, that we can appreciate, that we can work with. What would it look like in a different context, like in an email client? Well, I think we can take inspiration from web browsers that have this lock. For instance, here is cubes-os.org. And we can go on to more information, or first we see it's verified by Let's Encrypt, and then you can go on more information. You can learn about which certificate authority issued that. So we can do the exact same thing, for instance, in Thunderbird or whatever email client you have. Sequoia knows how to find all of the paths. They can be easily displayed. The user can click, click, click if they're interested. Drill down to learn more. And the great thing about drilling down to learn more is that you understand the system better, and then you have more confidence in it that it's doing the right thing. All right, so I'm, I'm worried only about my privacy, don't have security concerns, and I'm willing to completely rely on keys.openpgp.org. What can I do? Can I use it? It's pretty easy. What we do in SQ is we have a command sqpki link add, and we say, 287, that's our local certificate for keys at openpgp.org. We trust it for everything. And now any certificates that we download, they're automatically certified by that shadow CA. We've decided that we fully trust that shadow CA, which is not the default. And then if we ever run SQ encrypt dash dash recipient email uses at sequoia-pgp.org, it works, no complaints. All right, so we have two options so far. We have directly checking certificates. That's a pain in the butt. We have global CAs, which we can kind of sort of trust if we're only worried about privacy, but that's it. Is there something in between? It turns out, yes, there is. We can have federated CAs, and they're actually really easy to run. What is a federated CA? It basically means that you have an organization that is running a CA, and in many organizations, we already have system administrators or in activist groups, you have one or two people who are sort of better informed. They're teaching everybody about OPSEC anyway, so they can take some of this responsibility away. And in these cases, the interests are much more aligned. When I am an employee of a company, of course I'm going to trust the CA because the admins already have complete control over my laptop. They can install whatever software they want. And in the activist groups, the people that are teaching me, I'm relying on them to teach me the correct thing anyway. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be critical. So how do we use it? It's almost the exact same thing. Before it was sqpki link add dash dash ca star. And here we're looking at Sequoia's ca and I'm saying only use it for this domain. Oh, that's interesting, right? So I can use a CA, but I can scope it. So it's only for a particular domain. I'm willing to rely on the Sequoia CA to authenticate certificates in the sequoia-pgp.org organization. And then if we do a list, we see down here, it's authenticated. Now, maybe you don't want to talk to us, but maybe you care about cubes. If you've ever been to, for instance, FOSTEM, you'll see the cubes people, they walk around with a t-shirt, and on their t-shirt is their release key, you take a picture, you remember, ah, that's Merrick, yeah. And again, you can do the exact same thing. You can say sqpki link add, and we're gonna again limit it just to cubes-os.org, and this is their CA key. And if we go ahead and we fetch Merrick's key, or certificate from keys.openpgp.org, we see it's fully authenticated, and it's not because of the keys.openpgp.org CA, it's because of this one here, the 427. Can you manage a CA with SQ? You can do it in two commands. You can generate a CA key. Here we do SQ key generate. We say that it cannot sign and it cannot encrypt because the only reason that we want this certificate is to certify other keys, other certificates. So we make it a little bit more narrow. And here we create a CA certificate for example.org. Alice at example.org is part of the organization. We check that indeed 34E8 
belongs to Alice, we certify that, and then we can publish it on the key servers or on a WKD. And if even that is too complicated for you because you have an organization, you can use, for instance, OpenPGP CA, which is management software that deals with these key lifetime management issues. All right, so authentication with SQ, what does it look like? SQ automatically collects lots of weak evidence. It encodes it in the web of trust using these shadow CAs. We also collect autocrypt information and TOFU information, and that's all also encoded using web of trust data structures. SQ makes these delegations, so saying that somebody should be, or some certificate should be treated as a CA easier and safer. We have a, a local trust route, we have these shadow CAs, you can use this relatively easy command, sqpki link. And the, the really important thing is, is that all of these certifications are non-exportable, which means that you don't reveal your social graph. SQ provides transparency, which is essential for UX. Users need to understand how the system is working in order to have confidence that it works. I showed you SQPKI list and show paths, and then it automatically shows you why a certificate is considered authenticated or not. And then we provide lots of hints along the way to guide the user to do the safe thing. So we observe that the web of trust is a lot more than just a key signing party, which lots of people seem to think that it is. It's a powerful and flexible trust model. Anyone can certify a name and a certificate binding, and anyone can act as a trusted introducer, but it's up to users to opt in. Users choose their own CAs. And when they choose a CA, they don't have to rely on that CA completely. But just, they can scope that trust. So I hope I've convinced you that SQ is able to cater to multiple threat models. And I hope I've convinced you why that that's important, because people don't want to learn these tools. At least most people don't. SQ decided to, or we decided, that SQ requires authentication. But we try to make it really easy to use. So that's the the SQ part, and I want to leave you with one more important thing. I talked a lot about authentication, and authentication has to do with PKIs. And I think most people have learned over the last 10 years that you don't implement your own crypto library. And so my, my wish, the thing that you also take with you, the other small thing, is that you don't implement your own PKI. Just don't do it. Thank you for your attention. My, there we go. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> we have a few more minutes for questions, if there are any in the audience. Here's one. So the program, is, is it written entirely in Rust, or are there some linkings to, are there any C bindings used? Because that is also common in a few Rust crypto applications. Mm -hmm. We have five different crypto backends, so you can use Nettle, which is the default on Debian, I believe. You can use OpenSSL, which is the default for Red Hat. We have Boton bindings. We have CNG for Windows. And we have Rust Crypto, if you prefer that suite of um, crypto implementations. And some of those are indeed C. And all of them include assembly. So it's not 100% Rust, but it's not clear to me when anything is ever 100% Rust, because in the end you go down to libc that's implemented in, in C, and you have your kernel, and you know that's often implemented in C. So the Sequoia components are, are all written in Rust. Another question, maybe? I don't see anything from the audience. Uh, if I wanted to do my mail with Sequoia, which clients can I choose from right now? Because I know traditionally most clients use GPG uh, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. I think Thunderbird went off and did their own thing at some point. Uh, which client would be available to me to use with Sequoia? Right, thanks. Extra slide. 
bonus. How can you use Sequoia today? So SQ has been packaged for Debian, Fedora, Arch, etc. But as I mentioned, that's not the only tool that we have. We also have a GPG-SQ, which is a drop-in replacement for GPG. So if you want to use Sequoia, um, if you want to try it out, it's easy. If you, if you try it out, then you might have the impression, ah, okay, I only have a couple of programs where I can use SQ and the rest are still using GPG, what can I do? No, you just install the chameleon and then it automatically uses the, the same state as SQ. You can use SQ, PKI, blah, 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 and all of that stuff automatically appears in GPG, which is really nice and really smooth. So if you have a program that uses GPG, you install this, it's available, for instance, in Debian testing, it's available in Fedora, and bam, you're done, you're using SQ down below, even though the program hasn't changed. On, you specifically asked about Thunderbird, so Thunderbird uses uh, a different OpenPGP implementation, but um, we were unhappy with that for a number of reasons, in particular, again, this idea that you can't share the state so you have two different certificate stores, you have to copy your secret key material into Thunderbird, that's not so great. Uh, Thunderbird doesn't support the web of trust and there are a lot of people who have invested in that um, and so we did a, a re-implementation of that interface, we call that the octopus, and that is also available in Debian and Arch and Fedora, you install it and then your Thunderbird magically is using uh, Sequoia underneath. And because it's a non-default, it's not something that everybody is using, but there are so many issues and, and questions about it that we know that we have a, a lot of users and it does seem to, to work for many people. All right, and that's time. Uh, Neil is doing important infrastructure work. Uh, we need those people that are willing to spend the time and effort on software that if you don't get it right, it can actually kill you in certain circumstances, or indirectly in this case. So let's give another huge round of appreciation to Neil and his uh, colleagues, co-workers, uh, project members.